Um, welcome to the 2021 Groundfish Seminar Series. This is the sixth of nine Groundfish Seminars running through December 14th. Um, just a reminder to everyone, we are recording this. And since we are all doing this remotely, um, the speaker will use an electronic pointer or, use dis or be descriptive when indicating specific points on the slide. And to help with this format, please mute your audio or turn off your video feed or and turn off your video feed to reduce distractions for all the other participants. Also, please keep your questions for the end of the seminar. Um, at that time, you'll be able to unmute and ask your question directly to Laura, or um, you can type your question into the chat box anytime during the seminar and I will compile them to ask at the end. So before I introduce today's speaker, I'll remind people that our, sem our seminar series is taking a two week break after today. There will be no speaker next week due to the plan team meetings, and then there will not be a speaker the following week either for the Thanksgiving holiday. Our next speaker, Donnie Arthur of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and the U University of Alaska Fairbanks Banks CFOS, will present his talk entitled Counting Yellowfin Rockfish Eggs from My Couch and Other Reproductive Findings from Prince William Sound and the Northern Gulf of Alaska. And that talk will be held at the same time on Tuesday, three weeks from now, which is November 30th. So now I, I will introduce Laura. Laura Slater is a PhD candidate in fisheries at the University of Fairbanks College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences. She's studying the, the mating dynamics of snow crab to improve the understanding of stock renewal processes. She is also a supervisory fisheries biologist with experience managing research programs and teams. She worked in this role at the Alaska Department of Fish and Game in Kodiak for 14 years with a focus on crab research. She recently shifted her focus to stream fish and is working for the Russian River Salmon and Steelhead Monitoring Program for California Sea Grant in Santa Rosa, California. She also serves as the co-chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee for the Western Division of American Fisheries Society. I'll pass the virtual mic to you now, Laura. Great, thank you, Liz. I wanna thank uh, both Mark and Liz for inviting me to present today and for organizing this great groundfish seminar series um, that I've been enjoying uh, for many years now. Thank you to everyone who is joining us in the audience today or who will be watching this recording later. My knowledge and work on this topic have greatly benefited from contributions by my co-authors, which include my graduate advisor, Gordon Cruz, and collaborators, William Guyman, Joel Webb, and Doug Pengilly. The material that I'm sharing today is a compilation of many efforts and covers these topics at a high elevation. Why does reproduction matter? Life history considerations for Eastern Bering Sea snow crab. Our findings and conclusions um, in context with other findings and conclusions and management implications. To introduce the topic of reproduction, NOAA has a dedicated working group on reproductive biology and management. I was fortunate to participate in one of their meetings five years ago and I'm continually impressed by their collective work. It's great to see this topic getting attention. Since the snow crab fishery harvests large males from the population, our underlying questions relate to the impact of those removals. Detection of reproductive changes have been reported for other crab stocks as a result of a lack of large males in the population due to either fishery removals or natural processes. Some of these impacts have included male sperm depletion, reduced fertilization rate and egg clutch size, and changes in the mating dynamics, including who is participating in the mating, the mate guarding time of the female crabs, the amount of material passed to the female during mating, and how combative the interactions are during competitive dynamics. Some measures of reproductive biology that are or could be incorporated into the management of Eastern Bering Sea Crab include measures of mature female biomass. Um, Maddie Heller Shipley, who I noticed on the call today, um, has done great work in looking at 
thresholds on Eastern Bering Sea tanner crab harvest levels, harvest strategy, uh, effective spawning biomass as applied in the red king crab stock, um, and egg production index um, that's available for uh, snow crab, and sex ratios, which is one of the focuses of my study. Getting deeper into the question of why should we care about reproduction, especially in instances where the stock recruit relationship is weak, as it is for our EBS snow crab, it still provides a general indication of the health of population renewal processes. It allows us the opportunity to look for warning signs, and it adds context for a fuller picture of how the population is doing. It's one piece of a complicated puzzle at times. Moving into some of the life history considerations that are important to snow crab. Uh, all crab in the genus Canisetes undergo a terminal molt, after which further growth stops. Uh, that terminal molt is related to a morphometric maturity for both males and females, and uh, general maturity for females. The size at which this final molt occurs changes with temperature, and therefore in the eastern Bering Sea, it decreases with latitude. Crab molt to that final size at a smaller size in colder temperatures, so as you move north. There is a difference in size between adult males, uh, as shown in this picture, and adult females. Uh, we have our male in the grasping embrace with a female before mating. Uh, females reach adulthood before males and have a shorter reproductive lifespan due to senescence. This difference in both the size and the age at maturity between males and females results in natural large fluctuations in the adult sex ratio as the passage of a large year class moves through the stock. Additionally, although males have a terminal molt, uh, it is they are also physiologically mature as an adolescent male. So in the molts before that final molt, they can participate in mating. And there are choices that can be made for those adolescent males between putting energetics into growth and mating on an annual scale or putting energetics into reproduction and participating in reproducing. This can result in skip molting um, or molting every two to three years instead of every year. And it has consequences for those males that participate in that strategy both from an energetics standpoint and from a lifetime reproductive output standpoint. There are competitive dynamics across among the males. Large adult males are more able, are stronger and more able to secure mates when they're present relative to small and adolescent males. And snow crab have a polygamous mating system where males can mate with multiple females um, within a mating season, across mating seasons, and females can do the same. The terminal molt to maturity for females um, moves us from females with a large abdomen, the immature females, to the adult female with a large ab abdominal flap. We use the index of shell age over time as a context of the time elapsed from that terminal molt to maturity through the remaining lifespan for these, for these crab, females and males, because this is a great picture of females, and so we'll talk through it here. Uh, we move from those females that have recently molted, their final molt, we call those new shell females um, when they are adult and have produced their first clutch, are also called mimbrous, and when they produce subsequent clutches, they're called multiparous. And we just generally use those gel conditions to talk about those different categories um, in the population. 
Maturity in males is difficult to assess, even though there's a morphometric change that categorizes the difference between a small claw and a large claw male. That difference is very minor and it takes measurements in order to see if you can't visually assess the maturity status, the, the adult status for males. There are different classifications that have been used as a relation between body size and claw size to help distinguish and parse out those that at a given size that may be immature or adult. But the, that inability to directly determine male maturity does make it complicated to assess factors important to sex ratio and reproduction. Uh, female snow crab have the ability to store sperm internally in their sperm storage organs called spermatheca. These sperm can be used in the current season of mating to fertilize the eggs extruded into the brooded clutch, and they can also be held within the spermatheca for use in subsequent years. We use this ability to provide a record of mating or the relative success of females to gain access to males for mating over time and space. We also, in looking at the contents of the spermatheca, we can also see differences in whether or not the material was contributed in a recent mating season, uh, what we call the fresh ejaculate, or previous mating seasons, and so old ejaculate. And these pieces of information help us to build the story that relates to the female mating success. Before we move into some of the spatial details that are important to snow crab life history in the Bering Sea, I wanna orient us to the Eastern Bering Sea. Many of you on the call are familiar with this, um, but I'll just go through this quickly. The Bering Sea lies between Alaska and Russia. Uh, the most of the Bering, the Eastern Bering Sea, falls within the economic exclu exclusive economic zone of the United States. Here's our separation line. Uh, most of this falls within the U.S. waters, and additionally, the Eastern Bering Sea is defined mostly by a very large continental shelf before deeper waters um, off the shelf edge. Zooming into the Eastern Bering Sea area a little bit more, this area encompassed by the blue outline, there are domains that are important to snow crab life history. These domains are described by oceanic fronts that roughly follow bathymetric Pathometric contours. So we talk about the inner domain as waters that are shallower than 50 meters, the middle domain as waters between 50 and 100 meters, and the outer domain as waters between 100 meters and the shelf edge, which is at about 200 meters. Most of the snow crab population occurs in the middle and outer domains. Looking at some of the factors important to connectivity of the population, here we're looking at an individual based model and larval transport as the eggs hatch and they're released into the uh, water stream. Uh, many of them move north with predominant uh, current patterns. And uh, especially in the middle domain, which is indicated by this central uh, band of um, grids. Additionally, uh, even though the larvae are transported to the north, the crab over time, especially as adults, move towards the south. So here we're seeing a picture across the eastern Bering Sea of movement of mature females. So the starting point of each arrow, each arrow is their point as a new shell female, 
and the end point of the area is is the era arrow is their point one year later as old shell females. So we roughly see the approximate distance moved by these populations over the course of a year. And we also see that some of those movement patterns can fall into three areas that we also use um, in our study as um, southeast, central, and northwest. So this movement over time towards the south results in segregation between the new shell and old shell females, where the new are mostly in the middle and the old are mostly in the outer. And snow crab distribution and the mating dynamics vary between new and old shell females. We do evaluate them separately through this work. In general, uh, the mating context um, for new shell females, since mating occurs simultaneously with the molt to maturity, the female is grasped in a pre molt state. Um, as a general rule, uh, and held through the molt. Um, here's a picture with the uh, molted exuviae of a female, and then mating occurs with the female in that soft shell condition, which means that the choice criteria during this mating season are largely, largely driven by males. In the old shell group of females, Females form aggregation mounds, which become a deterrent to males due to the pheromones that are released by these large pockets of females. And therefore, a lot of the mating dynamics for old child females are driven by female mate choice or the selection to leave this aggregation mound to participate in mating. In general, uh, snow crab populations have a periodic cyclic recruitment, and we see pulses every approximately seven years. This is providing information over time of pulses of new shell females. The extent of the cold pool in the Bering Sea impacts the reproductive tempo because it changes the duration of embryo development. In warmer waters, and so in, in waters in which the cold pool is retracted and most of the females are distributed in waters warmer than these cold waters up here, between one and two degrees, the threshold is variable, but if we take one degree, then it'll be the waters that are dark blue or colder. Uh, then most of the females are carrying brooded embryos that develop over the duration of one year. And years in which the cold pool extent covers much of the distribution of snow crab, especially where the new, sh new shell crab exist, uh, the embryos enter a diapause period and the development gets delayed and takes two years to complete. We have over time seen a retraction or reduction of the cold pool. Um, this was uh, this slide was um, what Mike Litza presented to the North Pacific Fishery Management Council in October and just nicely illustrates the cold pool uh, this year, a couple of years ago, and kind of you can see in recent time, 2017, 2013, were the years in which the cold pool was well established over the Eastern Bering Sea, especially across the distribution that's important to snow crab. So with that retraction of the cold pool, the population also contracts to the north because snow crab like it cold. Another complexity layer for snow crab in the Bering Sea, they do overlap with tanner crab. So in this figure, we see both the management areas, which overlap for the most part, and the, the main areas of harvest for either snow crab in blue or tanner crab in brown. And we see across much of this distribution, 
and overlap between those two species. Since those species um, both fall into the genus of Chianocetes are closely related, uh, interspecies mating can occur and hybrids do exist across the Eastern Bering Sea. Uh, we theorize that with the continued contraction of snow crab to the north, it'll likely reduce the overlap of tanner crab and diminish the occurrence of hybridization, but time will tell. The approach of our study was to collect data on female snow crab annually across the Eastern Bering Sea over a period of 10 years. During that time, we looked at measures of fecundity and female storage sperm. We added two years of collections to uh, bolster a genetic study that we performed, and specifically those collections allowed us to look at the paternity of brooded sires or brooded embryos within the clutch. All of these collections came from the amazing platform of the annual NOAA EBS bottom trough survey. And I would like to take a moment here to thank the many, many helping hands who made this possible who collected samples, transported samples, uh, collected data, and helped in a number of different ways to make this work possible. I'll start with the fecundity aspect of our findings. This work was led by Joel Webb. One of his findings including, included uh, the observation of senescence in females. And so here what we're seeing is mean fecundity with advancing shell condition. You notice that new shell females do have a lower fecundity than old shell females, and this is due to constraints of a smaller body size for the ovaries develop before that terminal molt to maturity, and probably some energetics associated with that molt to maturity. Uh, so a full clutch exists for old shell females and then declines with advancing shell condition. We see also um, a time series of the proportion of females that were barren and these determinations are made on that annual NOAA survey. Uh, we see this by shell condition with new shell, old shell, very old shell and very, very old shell. So we see a much higher proportion of females that have not produced eggs, that don't have any eggs in their abdominal flap um, across time in these older categories. Also of interest, uh, Joel found that the fecundity at size for snow crab in the Eastern Bering Sea was smaller than that for populations in other locations. Here, when we look at the blue symbols um, for old shell females, old shell females have a higher fecundity at size than new shell females. We see these blue symbols relative to the blue symbol indicating the Bering Sea fecundity at size and is quite a bit lower. For new shell females in red, we see the general symbols um, in a lighter red color for other areas are higher than that for new shell females in the Eastern Bering Sea. So the reproductive output, for whatever reason, is lower um, for snow crab in the Eastern Bering Sea. Joel developed an egg production index um, and developed that through the time series of available NOAA it survey data. Uh, this egg production index is in black here. Um, and he's showing that trend over time relative to indices of both mature female biomass in red and mature male biomass in blue. And what we see is that the egg production index follows that trend of mature female biomass but it deviates from the mature male biomass. There isn't as good confusion with the male biomass um, indice as with the female. Additionally, in some of those instances in which 
the egg production index differs or diverges from the mature female biomass occur during times when much of the distribution of uh, females in the Eastern Bering Sea are covered by cold waters and much of the production is uh, turned into biennial um, reproductive tempo. It takes two years for those eggs and so there's less of them uh, available for the population. James Murphy also looked at egg production index for um, female snow crab in the Eastern Bering Sea. He looked at this by shell condition um, with primiferous, generally meaning new shell, multiparous old shell. Uh, one of the great things illustrated in this figure from his paper in 2017 are the influence of proportion biennial proportion of those females on a biennial cycle rather than an annual cycle. So taking two years for their eggs to reach um, maturity to, to hatch. Um, we see that that affects the new shell females um, more than it does the um, um, Give me a second here. So in this figure here, figure C, we're looking at new shell females and in figure D, if we're looking at old shell females. Here we show that most of old shell females are on an annual cycle, that there's very few females over time on a biennial cycle. Whereas for new shell females, there's a pretty, it's, it's a more even mix of those females that are either on a one year or a two year cycle. And so because when that cold pool exists, it sits over the distribution of new shell, that proportion that gets shifted into a two year cycle, it hits stronger for that segment of the population. In general, looking for reproductive information, um, as an index of a, a signal of the reproductive health for the population here is shown also from James's paper, James Murphy's paper in 2017. It shows the clutch fullness index, which is taken on the NOAA survey each year, showing that over time um, for both new shell females in black and old shell females in gray. And what we see, especially for new shell females, is a pretty steady trend at three quarters full which is what we would expect given their constraints and body size associated with that multi-maturity. And while we do see some variability um, in the clutch fullness for old shell females, there's also the influence of senescence. And as um, the age of the population, the age of the females advances over time, that, that, that um, index can see some fluctuations. In general, we see no cause for concerns in terms of the production of eggs from the females. Additionally, we haven't seen evidence of sperm limitation, and this is based on the 10 year study evaluating embryo viability of those crab over time. And so here we have new shell females in red, old shell females in blue. Um, for the crab that we evaluated, most, the vast majority of those had viable eggs. And there were very few in these categories with, with eggs that could have been unfertilized or could have been um, in not good condition for a number of other reasons. Additionally, um, the, the pledge fullness index is taken during the summer survey season, shortly after eggs have been extruded into the clutch. And Joel evaluated uh, fecundity of females during the winter season, closer to the hatch timing, and found very di little difference in fecundity. So uh, evidence that there's very little embryo loss during that brooding time. Moving into the sperm side of the story, um, for our categories of new shell and old shell females, 
here we have a measure of the mass of content within the storage sperm for those females. We see an increase um, between shell conditions from new to old. Um, indicates a, a general remating or gathering of additional sperm in the um, spermatheca. Additionally, we see a lot of evidence of recent mating in those old shell females, and so fresh ejaculate within the sperm stores. And so this indicates that remating for snow crab is the norm in the eastern Bering Sea. Additionally, we see some spatial patterns. And so across those three areas we discussed earlier is generally the southeast, central, and northwest portions of the eastern Bering Sea. We see for both new shell and old shell females, greater amount of storage sperm in the southeast area and decreasing as we move north. And this pattern is persistent across time. And it likely reflects the size composition and maturity status of males available for mating across those different locations. In general, new shell females in the northern extent and the middle domain likely mate with adolescent males as that's who is in those locations. Uh, looking at those spatial patterns in another way, here we have uh, maps of the relative uh, sperm load um, for new shell and old shell females. Um, here we have just lines delineating the differences between the Northwest area, the central area and the Southeast area. And we also have um, bathymetric contours showing you the extent of the middle domain and the outer domain, just for context. Um, here, the take home message of the story is that a lot of the color that we see, even for both groups, is in the small category. These categories were developed for snow crab um, from a population in Canada that we'll talk more about um, here next. But what we see here, and this is an aggregate um, of average from a thicker load and across all 10 years of our study. But what we see is that in some of the areas where we're seeing some of a moderate load level are in the southeast and for old shell females that have accumulated sperm over multiple mating seasons. Snow crab have been well studied in the Bay St. Marguerite in northern Gulf of St. Lawrence. St. Lawrence. This work has been um, performed by Bernard St. Marie and many collaborators. And here, what I want to show is the context of spatial scale. Within this circle is a square, and that square represents the spatial extent of the Bay St. Marguerite in context to the Eastern Bering Sea. So even though we are comparing our indices of female reproductive potential to those observed for this snow crab population in the Bay St. Marguerite, there are very different spatial uh, underlying patterns going on, both in terms of like movement and access between those different portions of the population the adult males and the mature females. Looking, um, moving into adult sex ratios, um, here are a couple figures that show some preliminary um, summarization of adult sex ratio um, as the total number of males greater than or equal to 95 millimeters carapace width plus um, divided by those males plus all mature females um, detected in the population during the survey. We see that in some years, uh, the Eastern Bering Sea is more male dominated, and in some years, it's more female dominated. And so those sex ratios vary by year, and they still vary by area. So we can see this persistent, even in male dominated years, this persistent 
spatial segregation between the adult females where they are in pink and the adult males uh, where they are in blue. This X ratio um, extends between female biased in um, pink to male biased in blue. And so this middle, this balance zone in purple is very little of that um, detected across the Eastern Bering Sea. Looking at sex ratio patterns relative to that well-studied snow crab population in the Bay St. Marguerite, um, Saint, um, Bernard St. Marie and his colleagues uh, did observe an oscillation in sex ratio. And so here they have two sex ratios shown over a time series. Um, they define sex ratio in the same general formula as us. And in one sex ratio, they included all males. And another, they used males greater than 95 millimeters carapace width. And so you can see for both of these, the oscillation as a large recruitment pulse moves through the population. And then over here, we have an index of the female spermatheca load, the material stored in their spermatheca. And we can see a corresponding trend in that spermatheca load that's higher when we have more males are male dominated in the system and lower when there's more females in the system. Moving into some of the results from our genetics evaluation of this stored sperm. We looked uh, at the species detected in the uh, ejaculate layers within the female storage sperm across uh, 929 females and found that most of them made it with snow crab. Yay! <laughs> so snow crab are generally mating with snow crab. Less than two of those, I'm sorry, less than 2% of those that we looked at had mated with either a tanner or a hybrid male. And so this is a very low incidence of interspecies mating observed and these samples um, are across uh, the 10 year time um, study, the 10 years of our main study and the three spatial areas. Most of the interspecies, ma interspecies mating did occur in the southeast area when it did happen. We also took a look at the parentage of hybrid crab. So we looked at the maternal lineage of hybrids and found that the maternal lineage was either snow crab or tanner crab, meaning that the parentage of that hybrid resulted from either a snow crab female plus a tanner crab male intermating or a tanner crab female and a snow crab intermating. And they were roughly, roughly equivalent across the samples that we examined. Looking at the spatial patterns of that snow crab maternal lineage, we found that in areas where snow crab females mated with tanner crab males, that these areas in yellow these bars are broken off across six areas in the Eastern Bering Sea as determined as either the middle domain or the outer domain intersected with the southeast, central, and northwest areas. Within these areas, we found that most of the hybrid crab had snow crab returnal lineage in these areas where there are more snow crab females than tanner crab females. And we found those hybrids resulted from tanner crab maternal lineage in those areas where there are relatively more tanner crab females. Moving into the genetics results as it related to the estimated minimum number of mates that were detected in the stored sperm. Uh, let me orient you to my figure. Here we have the number, the, the minimum number of mates that contributed to that stored sperm. 
And this is the sperm that remains after extrusion of whatever clutches were fertilized before we have collected that female. Uh, we have new shell females in blue and old shell females in red. We see most females had evidence of mating with one male and very, and some with two and very few with three or four. We also had females that had no, um, no male signature remaining, no, no DNA um, sperm um, remaining in their sperm stores. And these were not females with empty spermatheca. There were contents, there were ejaculate material left but that ejaculate material did not contain um, sperm or that the DNA from that sperm was not detected through our genetics. This was looking at 991 females over that 10 year study. Looking at females from that additional two years of study where we looked, we held females in the lab and looked at embryos after they had um, developed to a sufficient state to detect um, and the, the contributed DNA from the unknown male and the known female. Um, we found again, here's the estimated number of sires for new shell and old shell. We found that predominantly the embryos were sired by a single male. There were instances of some with multiple males contributing to the paternity and this did occur with more frequency for the old shell females. Some of our take home messages from our uh, study on reproductive potential in general, hybridization uh, does not appear to be a pressing population concern. And we observed mating success for most of the females we evaluated, but although they have the capacity to store sperm, our results suggest that females are reliant on remating each year to successfully fertilize their eggs. The amount of stored sperm and the number of males mating and contributing to those stored sperms are low in the Eastern Bering Sea relative to a well studied snow crab population in the Bay St. Marguerite. And in that location in the Bay St. Marguerite, uh, greater success is observed um, for new shell females when there are a large abundance of large adult males. And so in that system, they saw the greatest mating success in terms of stored sperm when they had the greatest relative abundance, the greatest sex ratios of large adult males. So what does this mean for management? Um, Crab stocks in the eastern Bering Sea uh, have a biological conservation objective, which is intended to ensure the long term reproductive viability of king and tanner crab populations. The management is complex. It is a federal stock um, with harvest rules and harvest management also determined by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. So it's a great collaboration between those agencies looking out for these um, crab stocks. One of the research priorities that was added as important by the North Pacific Fishery Management Council in 2012 was the development of quantitative reproductive indices for Bering Sea crab stocks. And this research priority is classified as urgent by um, the Science and Statistical Committee. Uh, looking at the time series of abundance of mature females over time, this was taken from the NOAA annual trawl survey report for crab. Um, and in their draft version for this summer's, this recent summer's um, assessment. Uh, what we see for, we see different lines based on shell condition, but I just want to focus you in on the general trends where since the late 90s, when the stock um, was, when the stock abundance had collapsed, there has been recovery and there have been recruitment events, including large recruitment events, 
witnessed in the mature female population. When looking at the large male population, since that same decline in the late 1990s, there have been recruitment pulses, but the magnitude of those pulses have not been similar to that historically witnessed for this crab stock. Fast forward to this year, um, the snow crab population in the Bering Sea definitely saw a very marked decline. Um, without warning, without much um, indication as to what um, could have caused this decline. There are many people within the management community right now that are investigating and theorizing some of the things that could have driven this, um, this market decline. Uh, Cody Suzwalski is the stock assessment author at NOAA who works on the snow crab assessment. And these next two slides were taken from his presentation to the SSC um, last month. Um, I'm not going to go into details over these. Um, Cody did a really great job of providing some possible scenarios of why those crabs were not seen on survey this year. For additional context, the survey last year was canceled due to the pandemic, and so there is a gap of information from last year. Um, he also looked, he tracked down some of the information behind those theories. Um, some of the take homes, um, cod consumption, the predation on snow crab is very high. Um, bitter crab disease infections on these crabs is also very high. We've seen the bottom temperature increasing over time related to the loss of sea ice in the Bering Sea and that retraction of the cold pool that we showed earlier. He also looked at the influence of fishing um, and didn't see any, um, any, any large red flags in that domain. Just looking at temperature change over time, climate change, um, is occurring across Alaska in the, in the Bering Sea. And we see that over time, here's a um, sea surface temperature over time, and we see the 10 warmest in red have all occurred in the last 20 years. Um, not all, have mostly occurred in the last 20 years. So we know that the Bering Sea is warming. Uh, this recent collapse has certainly resulted in a direct management action, which included the sharp reduction of the overfishing limits, absolute biological catch, and harvest levels. Knowing that the snow crab population has complexity, many unknowns, and apparent no resilience to recover given the stock trend in large males over the last two decades, and the observation that snow crab do like it cold, they like to exist in cold locations. Um, we would generally recommend using a precautionary approach. It doesn't mean much. Um, so trying to move forward into how do we realistically incorporate reproduction into management. Um, some of our take home messages include spatial scale matters. Uh, right now, the management strategy is applied across the entire Eastern Bering Sea, and our findings underscore the importance of spatial management that could be used to maintain sex ratios within scales that are meaningful for reproduction. Inclusion of egg production index for mature female biomass into assessment and management could also help provide a buffer um, or an indicator of change times and continued monitoring for reproductive success um, could show uh, warning signs of failure or whether or not the influence of reproduction has much um, influence on the population health in general. Ultimately, we recognize that there are many factors and inputs to consider for a healthy population, and all of this is overlaid on the context of large environmental change. And so we provide our input on the reproduction as a piece of the multiple hands pulling on the same rope. 
I would like to thank our funders. Um, this work was made possible by a couple of North Pacific Research Board grant project grants. Um, NOAA funds for Bering Sea Crab Research, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, including Bering Sea Test Fishery Funds, and uh, funds um, that support my work as a graduate student, including the NPRB Graduate Student Research Award. There are many contributors and collaborators. Um, thank you all. You know who you are. I appreciate all the work you've done to make this project a reality. Thank my graduate committee and my family who keep me going strong every day. And with that, I'll take any questions. That was a great presentation, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone want to unmute themselves and ask questions directly to Laura? I don't see any questions in the chat yet. I've got a question. Great. Hey, Laura, it's Mike Lito. Thanks. Hi, Mike. That, was, that was a great talk. Um, really great. enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to drill down a bit on the current status, um, you know, that you touched at the end there. So, um, I wanted to ask in particular about sort of two things that are happening with the stock. We've got this huge senescence tidal wave coming through with the mature females. We're seeing 99% old shell or very old shell. At the same time that we're seeing this really uh, strong sex difference in distribution changes, all the large males out to the Northwest and the females not shifting. So, um, I wanted to sort of ask your, your expert opinion on what those, the, the combination of those 2 events might be for the reproductive status of the stock. Yeah, it's hard to say with certainty. Um, certainly the predominance of old shell females doesn't bode well. Um, the new shell females are the largest contributor of um, to the egg production indices, and that's usually based on their relative contribution to the overall abundance of mature females. Um, and, you know, additionally, the fact that we know that reproductive output declines with those advanced shell condition categories. Um, the location of the females also matters. One of the things I didn't touch on here, but that is important um, Ornsons postulated a theory that because of the location of new shell females on the middle domain, most of the larval advection patterns are advantageous for the larvae released from that location in terms of retaining it within the eastern Bering Sea shelf. Um, so in waters that are suitable for benthic settlement and survival. Um, with that said, though, um, you know, with some of the shifts of the mature female, where they are distributed, and who knows what's happening with some of those larval current patterns, um, assuming that they remain the same, it that definitely has an influence on where those eggs go and how likely those eggs are to contribute to successive generations. Um, in terms of the segregation of large males and females, we haven't seen anything different. <laughs> so even though the males are in a new place that's differently segregated from the adult females, in the time that I've worked on snow crab, so the last almost 20 years, um, 15 years, whatever it's been, um, there hasn't been a strong overlap. Like the adult, the large adult males are at a distance that's too far to travel based on what we know of the movement of large males to gain access to the majority of the adult females, especially the new shell females in years past. And so the population appears to function by mating with adolescent males provided those are available in the population. So I don't know if that helps or kind of gets to some of the bigger questions that you're asking, and I'd be happy to follow up with the conversation at a later time too.
Mike said thanks in the chat. Oh, great. Does anyone else want to unmute and ask a question? Dwayne says, great talk and great to see you, Laura. Mm -hmm. And Cheryl thank Barnes you. says, thank you for a great talk. We've got lots of thanks and interest coming in in the chat. Great. All right, so it sounds like we have no more questions. So I guess we will end this a couple minutes early. Everyone gets a couple more minutes back of their day. Thank you again, Laura. That was a really wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity and yeah, to share my work. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks everyone for coming. A record. All right. See you later. Bye everyone. Bye.